slowly peeked over Hall Ridge as its yellow rays gently kissed the dew-soaked pastures in Dry Cove. Inside the modest three-room cabin, Sarah Tate had just finished adding a log to the few embers that still remained from last night's fire. The children would be awake any minute now as she hurried out to collect a few eggs for the morning's breakfast. But these morning chores seemed to bring a bit of joy to Sarah's otherwise stoic face. For one thing, her husband never let her do much work due to her heart condition. She had lived with her whole life. But years ago, the old mountain doc had prescribed her a concoction of balsam oil and sassafras, and she had been getting along just fine ever since, thank you. Matter of fact, for the past three weeks, she had tended to the animals, worked the corn patch, chopped wood, and countless other chores on the homestead. She took a moment to look up at the sky. It looked like there wouldn't be any falling weather for the next couple days at least. Today would be just as good a day as any to keep working on that chestnut rail fence that she had been erecting. In her mind, it was about time that fence got finished. She had been on her husband since last spring to build it, but he claimed he would get around to it sometime. (laughs) Just like he claimed that he would fix that leak in the roof. Heck, he'd been promising to build Sarah a new sitting chair for two years. A woman can't understand what it takes to do a man's work, he would always tell her. But in her mind, it seemed her man was always busy doing something other than what he ought to be doing. So the past three weeks had been a welcome change for her as she stepped into the role of head of the household. She had already fixed the leak in the roof, made progress on the fence, and doggone it, she was going to build her own chair too before he came back to teach him a thing or two about the work ethic of a true mountain woman. Her husband, Tom, had been away for nearly a month working for the newly formed Western North Carolina Railroad Company. He was the foreman of a crew that consisted of nearly 100 men who were tasked with clearing the rugged forest over on Brushy Mountain in preparation for the new railroad spur that was being built to haul out lumber from the Little River Lumber Camp. But the work was dangerous, to say the least, as the men cut through the virgin forest that was home to every wild beast known to mankind, and even some, that were rumored to be mythical. Each day was filled with a countless blast and explosions through the granite rock and the cracking sounds of monster trees that had grown for hundreds of years as they came crashing to the forest floor. And it was a dangerous job too. Tom's crew had already lost two men. One had been crushed by a tree and the other had fallen from a wooden bridge that was being built over Bullhead Branch. Despite the risk, This was the first paying job to ever come through this section of the mountains. Six dollars a week, too. And that was more money than Tom had ever seen in his whole life. And he hoped to be able to buy all five of his youngins some new shoes and a new dress for Sarah and maybe even a fancy store-bought chair that he had been eyeing for. As the morning whistle echoed across the narrow valley, walled in by mountains on all sides, Tom picked up his sledgehammer and pick and set out for another hard day's work. Today would be a busy day too, as the men had been using dynamite to blast a tunnel through Old Brushy for the past week. As the sun rose in the sky, the mountaineer looked over at his buddy Earl. Looks like that hawk's gonna be flying high today, Tom said. Ain't it though? I reckon a fellow would be right smart to drink plenty of water today, or that old monkey will jump right on his back, Earl replied. And with that, the two men joined a score of other men, heading into the mouth of the tunnel with Tom in the lead and Earl bringing up the rear. Once the men were about 200 feet in, without any warning, Earl sent something. What in tarnation was that? He thought to himself, and there it was again. 
A small tremble felt underneath his feet, yet this time, every mountaineer up ahead of him froze. It seems all that blasting had made the tunnel unsteady, and within an instant, there was the rumble of rocks and boulders crash into the floor as the roof began to give way. Get out of there, boys! Earl shouted to the crew up ahead of him as he made a mad dash to get out of the dark tunnel. Just as he made it to the exit, the entire roof fell, trapping 11 men in the darkness with no food or water. Before long, the entire camp of nearly 90 men were on the scene trying to dig through the rubble to rescue the men. For two days, they worked around the clock, but it was no use. They didn't have any equipment strong enough to remove the boulders, and the use of dynamite was feared to further worsen the dire situation. On the third day, the company doc told Earl, I'm afeard it's too late. Ain't nary bit of chance a man could survive in there without food or water at these temperatures, and I'm pert sure the air is run dry by now. It's a powerful, sorrowful thing to say, but I reckon we need to send word back home to their families. A dark cloud settled in on the camp as several men set out on the journey across the mountains back to Dry Cove to inform each man's next of kin of his unfortunate demise. Earl had been friends with Tom since they were young boys. He'd even been the best man when Tom and Sarah were married 12 years earlier. He figured the only right thing to do was go and tell her in person of her husband's untimely fate. When Earl reached Sarah, she was alone since all the children were off to school for the day. She sat quietly, stitching small scraps of fabric together as part of a quilt she had been making for the last few days. She recognized Earl as he hitched his horse and approached the porch. Howdy, Earl. What brings you out this way? I didn't expect to see any menfolk back in the cove for at least the next two weeks on account of the contract work. Earl removed his hat, and the two walked together into the main room of the cabin. Knowing that Sarah had a history of a weak heart, he did the best he could to break the news of Tom's death as gentle as possible. At first, he spoke in short, broken sentences, with only hints of her husband's demise. Sarah listened intently as the friendly look on her face slowly faded into a blank, emotionless void as she began to suspect that Earl's visit was potentially serious. Sarah, I really don't know how to break this to you, but I know Tom would want me to be the one to tell you. It still don't make it nary one bit easier, though. I'm at a powerful loss for words right now. There was an accident, a tunnel collapse, and Tom was one of a score of men trapped inside. It's been four days since it happened, and every man is afeard, lost forever. Unlike many mountain women who hear such news with a numbing disbelief, Sarah's reaction was immediate. She wept inconsolably with her face in her hands, tears falling like a summer rain on the fabric that still laid across her lap. Once the storm of sorrow had subsided, Earl picked up his hat and he rode off into the distance with the sound of his horse slowly fading as he crossed over Nelson's Gap. Soon, there was nothing but silence. Sarah felt weak, and she sank into the split-bottom kitchen table chair, with her body and soul weighed down by complete exhaustion. Her heart throbbed in her chest with each new breath. Through the kitchen window, she stared with vacant eyes across the narrow valley. A gentle breeze blew through the chestnut trees, their beautiful white flowers dancing in the distance, as spring had recently swept over the mountainside. The smell in the air hinted that there might be fallen weather soon. Suddenly, through the numbing silence, she began to notice the birds singing. Slowly, something began to approach her, a sensation that she couldn't seem to articulate. It crept over the mountains in the distance, across the valley, and through her window, reaching for her through the senses, the sounds, the scents, and the colors of the vast forest that surrounded the homestead. She began to think, Oh my Lord! I'm on my own now. I can do things my own way. No one can hold me back. I'm finally free of him. Her chest was pounding, and she felt ashamed of the terrible thoughts going through her head. Suddenly, 
The emptiness inside of her was full of a newfound freedom. Her fragile heart was racing like a rush of warm water had washed over her. No, this wasn't grief. This was joy. She looked beyond the sorrow of her husband's death and she saw a future, a future that belonged solely to herself. Never again would he dictate her life. She would live for herself on her own terms. Now, she did love her husband, but she even had to admit to herself that sometimes she had longed for a life without him. But now, the mystery of what might have been seemed inconsequential compared to this newfound freedom that she had been gifted with. I'm free. I'm finally free, a voice inside of her repeated. The tears had now dried into salty streaks on her face and stood in stark contrast to the widening smile on her face and the joy that she felt in her heart. There was no need to fight it. Indeed, this is how she really felt. Suddenly, there was a knock at the door. Oh no, she gasped. The children are home from school. How will I ever tell them? They'll be devastated. Get yourself together, Sarah, she told herself as she approached the door. Slowly, she turned the door handle and lifted her eyes. A terror seized her body. Standing before her was her husband with a brand new store-bought chair. A sudden gasp. And Sarah's body collapsed to the ground, dead before she hit the floor. The complete shock had stopped her fragile heart. Turns out Tom and the other trapped men had used their axe and picks, and they dug for three days before hitting a cave that led upwards and out of the mountain. Every man had survived. Tom dropped the gift that he had spent his entire earnings on for his wife and crumpled down beside her, holding her in his arms. And in that moment, he was a broken man, for he had lost the love of his life. Everything that he had ever worked for was now lost forever, and his life in Dry Cove would never be the same. Thank you.